Pitkin salutes our Buffalo Bills for 35 years of football excitement and glory. At Chase Pitkin, we know being number one means outperforming your competition and bringing something new to the game. It requires unwavering dedication and loyalty to our customers, teamwork, and community spirit. From all of us at Chase Pitkin to the Buffalo Bills, thank you for giving us the best you've got. the very, very best that all our football players have. We're going to play with a lot of pride, a lot Where of Where would you rather be? Right here and right here now. Here is Thurman Thomas. He breaks through at the 30, at the 35, 40, 45, midfield, one man to beat. Touchdown, Joe Cribb goes all the way for the score. And that should be the one that runs They are standing up and they are cheering. O.J. Simpson, he just set a new National Football League record of 261 yards. For 35 years, the Buffalo Bills have maintained a standard of excellence matched by few NFL teams. The Bills have produced 16 winning seasons, nine division titles, and an unprecedented four consecutive conference championships. AFL's founding franchises. The Bills had a humble beginning, but they persevered through years of glory, years of pain, to take their place as one of the NFL's greatest success stories. Well, naturally, I'm very proud uh, of the um, of the Bills, uh, particularly in the last uh, uh, six years. Um, we had an up, an up and down history from uh, 1960 when we started in the old uh, you know, American Football League. Uh, had some good seasons and some bad seasons. Uh, but since 19, I think it's 88, uh, why we've been on the upswing. And uh, of course, nationally it's more enjoyable. Uh, the fans in the uh, community have been excited and it's given them a lot of pleasure. This is the story of a tough team, its proud town, and the 35-year journey they have taken oh. together. It's a tale of comebacks what and cliffhangers, trials and triumphs, gallant players and gutty fans, and the great moments they have shared. It is at Stadium. This crowd just wants to stand and savor the greatest moment in Buffalo sports history. Hi, I'm Steve Sable. No NFL team has achieved a level of excellence as enigmatically as the Buffalo Bills. Take their four straight Super Bowl appearances. Forgotten in those defeats is their accomplishment of winning an NFL record four consecutive conference championships. Now, even when the Bills won back-to-back -back AFL titles, their Deeds were diminished by the perception of that league being a Mickey Mouse operation. You might say the Bills are just, they're just like the city they represent. Proud, tough, always striving for respect. And like the town of Buffalo, the Bills are survivors. A team that has endured a cold and cruel climate by maintaining a tradition of hard-hitting, rugged defense. And that tradition is as strong today as it was when the Bills played in an ancient arena known as War Memorial Stadium. War Memorial Stadium was never considered a sports show palace, even when it first opened during the Depression. But by the 1960s, the rickety confines had become the home for one of football's most powerful defenses. 
it's like history. Time stands still when you go on War Memorial. When you come through a tunnel, you don't know what you're going to expect because the fans are a foot away from you. They can reach through a fence and touch you. They, at one time when we lost a game where we should have won, uh, they collected 12 full cases of beer cans off the field. Because Buffalo fans, uh, when you're supposed to win, you're supposed to win. From 1964 through 1966, the Bills did almost always win. They ruled the wide open, point a minute American Football League with one of the most dominating, innovative, and tactically sound defenses in history. The 11 of them, and they played all the time together, that was a group that knew one another and that knew exactly what they needed to do every uh, Sunday to be uh, in a position to win. It was really a fine defensive football team. We played man-to-man, -man. we played the bump and run, uh, but most of all we had a great rush from our defensive linemen and it gave us a better opportunity to be able to cover wide receivers and it gave our linemen a, a better chance to rush the pass which made us a better defensive secondary. The general defensive picture was overseen by head coach Lou Saban, but its sophisticated wrinkles sprung from the fertile mind of staff assistant Joe Collier. He was a defense mastermind. He can take an offensive team and just pick it apart. He will set defense for any play whatsoever. Collier never had signals on the, on the sideline. Harry Jacobs always called a senior. He was a quarterback. I did believe in an aggressive conservatism. Our coaches developed the defenses to do the things that they wanted us to do, but they really left it up to me to call what was going to be played on the, on the field at any time that I wanted to, to make the call, and I made all the calls. The Bills were masters of disguise, often lining up Jacobs, a middle linebacker at defensive tackle. Defensive end, Tom Day, hovering menacingly in the gap. Or George Sames as an AFL pioneer with the safety blitz. Buffalo could take such chances because their front line was anchored by a rock named Tom Sestak. Sestak was the guy on that defense. He was a great player, uh, uh, extremely strong, very physical, great, great competitor, very, very intense player. Career was shortened because of a knee injury, but he was really the key guy in my mind on that defensive unit, played defensive tackle for us and was an outstanding player. The massive Sestak was assisted by linemen Ron McDowell and Jim Dunaway, two behemoths who loved tackling blue plate specials as much as quarterbacks. Food was the most important thing to these guys. They had a place here uh, in Dunkirk called Rush's, and they had lobster dainties which were about this size, and you, all you could eat for four ninety five. So we all went down. Dunaway was, his number was 78th and McDowell was uh, 72. So they decided they were going to eat their number in Lobster Dainies. But they went beyond that. I think McDowell ate 90 some and, and Dunaway ate 80 something, whatever it was, with french fries and then they had double butterscotch sundaes afterwards. And the guy came out and told him to get out and don't ever come back. It appeared as if the Bills had bitten off more than they could chew when they hosted the 1964 title game. The defending champion Chargers scored early and were threatening again when the Buffalo defense made one of the most famous plays in AFL history. Linebacker Mike Stratton drilled Keith Lincoln with the shot heard round the world. That play when uh, Lincoln was going to catch the ball and uh, I think it's Tobin Roque that was throwing the ball to him. Uh, and Lincoln reached up. Stratton hit him just as the ball was going through Lincoln's hands and broke uh, four of his ribs. And you could hear the crack. And after that, you could see on San Diego get drained. The power to take and execute drain it. From then on, we started beating. 
our defense shut down San Diego's offense. The defensive line played a tremendous game that day. Our linebackers held their running backs in check coming out of that backfield, and that was one of their assets, was uh, Paul Lowe and Keith Lincoln coming out of that backfield, which actually gave Butch Bird and myself a, a more or less a day off because they just didn't have a chance to run their passing patterns the way they wanted to. The Bills repeated as AFL champs a year later in a rematch with the Chargers. This time, San Diego did not even come close to scoring. All we read out of the papers out there was it wasn't who was going to win the game, but how badly San Diego was going to beat us. So that did motivate us defensively and to be able to shut out the most prolific scoring team in all of football uh, in a championship football game was <laughs> exceptionally a good feeling. As the defensive quarterback for the Buffalo Bills championship years, I believe our defense should be remembered as the best nose-to-nose, -nose, straight up defense there ever was. We were all in a situation in those days where, again, no one made a lot of money. But it wasn't important, the friendships that I made. Everybody knew everyone. And those are the things that you can't put a price on. When we lost Sestak, most everybody came back. We lost John Tracy off of that team. And those are people that you would like to see live, at least outlive you. And then you'd be happy. They're all friends. We were a, a separate body of eight teams that were going against the National Football League and the fans of the world. And we won. And we won. Ball is quiet now at the corner of Best and Jefferson. But if you listen carefully, you can hear the roar of the crowd as they cheer on the Buffalo Bills, whose tradition of defense is now carried on by a new breed of players, led by number 78, Bruce Smith. Smith, the Bills' number one draft pick in 1985, has been the driving force behind the Buffalo defense that has rekindled fond memories of their 1960s predecessors. swift and savvy. Bruce Smith is the all-time AFC sack leader and also a leader by example. Indeed, his spontaneous enthusiasm often lifts the level of play of his teammates, who know that it's time to start hitting when Bruce says it's... Hammer time! Hammer time to me is big plays on defense. Um, I get a sack and a forced fumble. You do something to disrupt the offense. And Elway is hit and sacked! He fumbles! get on him and you pound on him, you never let him get back up. I mean, you just keep beating down on him until you can't see the head of the nail anymore. It's, it's about an inch down into the wood and you just keep, keep pounding and keep pounding. In the decade of the 90s, few NFL defenses have been more aggressive, more punishing, or more opportunistic.
ball, and Boomer wants to throw, and it is intercepted there. Picked off by Kelly. He's down the sidelines to the 40, the 30, the 20. The Buffalo Bills defense of the 90s. They are an eclectic, enthusiastic fun bunch that have kept alive the serious business of defense that first made the Buffalo Bills great. Hey, baby, are y'all convinced now? Smith can talk the talk, but for the most part, Buffalo's football heroes have quietly let their on-field performances speak for themselves. Uh, certainly that's been the case with Thurman Thomas, the low-key but high-voltage superstar of the 90s. Uh, it's true, too, of O.J. Simpson, perhaps the greatest bill of them all. And it also applies to Jack Kemp, the quarterback who quietly led Buffalo to a pair of AFL titles before he did his real talking as a member of the United States Congress. Jack Kemp traveled a long way to reach the hallowed halls of Washington. After an unsuccessful stint in the 1950s NFL, Kemp starred with the San Diego Chargers before literally stumbling his way onto Lou Saban's Buffalo Bills. He came to us uh, with a bum hand. Uh, we stayed with him for about six or seven weeks until he began to heal, but about that time when Jack became well, the fortunes of the, of the Buffalo Bills began to change. With their new quarterback, the Bills became winners, but Kemp, more accustomed to the wide open style of the Chargers, occasionally disagreed with Saban's more conservative strategies. Jack Kemp as a player was at times uh, very stubborn. I remember one game in which I insisted that he throw a particular pattern. Nothing seemed to happen. I said, Jack, do you mind if we discuss this at halftime? He says, well, fine, coach. Uh, I'd be very happy to discuss it with you. I said, Jack, I want you to throw 52. I don't want to say it again. And he looked at me, he says, but, and I picked him up. It happened to be an open locker behind him. And I shoved him into the locker and I says, Jack, do you understand me? He says, yes, sir, coach. And we threw that pass in the second half. I think he must have rolled up over 100 yards just with that one particular pattern. Kemp's determination was also his greatest attribute, as the Bills would discover for three straight championship seasons. In 63, we lost to Boston, we got booed, and I told, I went up to uh, Coach uh, Saban, and I said, Coach, next year we're going to win. And you and I are going to come out in the middle of the crowd, and we're going to have our moment in the sun. And don't forget that. In 1964, Kemp beat his former team, the Chargers, 20-7, to giving the Bills their first ever league title. A year later, Buffalo beat San Diego again for their second AFL crown. Kemp became a household name and a respect 
respected figure throughout Western New York, quarterbacking the Bills for the remainder of the decade. But by 1969, new challenges awaited. Now, I had spent 13 years throwing a football, and uh, I'll be honest, whether my arm or elbow had started to give out, I, I couldn't throw as well as I thought I wanted to. I was president of the Football Players Union or Association. I was an activist. I would have been called a clubhouse lawyer if I'd been a baseball player, because I loved organizing people and talking about issues and ideas. So the Republican Party said, hey, Kemp, uh, why don't you run for Congress? Uh, and I thought about it. And, uh, if I'd lost, I, I would have come back. I had a no-cut contract. I could have come back and exercised the no-cut clause. In fact, I've had a lot of fun over the years telling people that if they didn't like me to Congress, I'd come back and play quarterback for the Bills, and that's how I got sent to Washington. It was a, another manifestation of a lesson I had learned early in my life to be there at the right time and to take advantage of opportunities and I had the great blessing and opportunity to serve the people of Western New York for 18 years in the United States Congress. Jack Kemp, a football and an American success story with more chapters still waiting to be written. In the snow and sleet of Shea Stadium, O.J. Simpson, number 32, became the first player in history to rush for more than 2,000 yards in a single season. O.J. running left, O.J. five more! There it is! He did it! He did it! Yeah. I just wonder if the three of us at this moment fully realize what it has been our great privilege to watch O.J. Simpson run for 2,000 yards in one season. The records and statistics speak well, but not as eloquently as the memories. O.J. was the only player I ever played against in, in a pro, or with in a Pro Bowl, who in practice made some moves where the entire Pro Bowl squad, and this is, this is running through plays in the Pro Bowl, stopped in, in, in awestruck. And guys said, did, did you see what he did? I mean, can you believe what that guy just did? At six feet one, 215 pounds, O.J. Simpson was a power runner with a sprinter's speed. And beyond the speed, there was an instinct for the light, a sense of where the defense had become frayed and vulnerable. He knew precisely where to strike, and once in the secondary, he gave defenders very little to strike at. I would rather duke a guy and try to make guys miss, uh, but I always considered myself, I carried the ball so much that I was a pretty physical ball player also. I mean, I ran inside a lot. And uh, normally what you would do is, early in the game, you'd pick out a DB, especially a, an undersized DB, and you'd bone him a few times, you bone him once or twice. What that would do is make it a little easier to duke him later on. There was always muscle behind Simpson's magic. He took great pride in his stamina and strength as a runner, and even claimed some knockouts as a blocker. I knocked out Bubba Smith. Bubba, I didn't want to tell this story. <laughs> I knocked out Bubba in the game, but Bubba gave me a different story about it, but I knocked out Bubba in the game. What happened was I was on the outside move, and I dipped inside uh, to get the tackle off of me, and when I came back outside, I ran into his form. You know, I mean, it wasn't like he was trying to throw something. I mean, uh, O.J. has never blocked nobody in his life. And I told Ted Hendricks, I said, if they're going to sweep your way, hold him. I'll be a tenth of a second behind him. Just hold him up. I want to get a shot at him. He came back in the game, you know, about, oh, I guess the next series. I'm going to get you, boy. I'm going to get you. So the rest of the game, I'm running from uh, Bubba. <laughs> The pursuit of the juice was never a trivial one, and four times he led the NFL in rushing. In the opening
open field, he had an instinctive feel for danger. And unlike many of today's great runners, he wore only a minimum of protective padding. You know, I wore very few pads because I like to feel people grabbing at me. You know, you can almost sense, you know, you, people don't have to touch you for you to feel them. You can, they can get close to you and you can feel them. And I needed to feel all of that so I can react to all of it. You develop a sense of yourself, a sense of total control. At that point, you think you can whip everybody on the field. I think I'm the toughest guy on the field. He got our fastest guy, Lamar Parrish, one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, and made poor Lamar, you know, look like he was just, just standing there. And Lamar even came back to the huddle kind of giggling, looked at us and said, well, you know, what do you guys expect? Expectations were always high when O.J. Simpson carried the ball. And he captured the imagination of fans and players alike. He was a record breaker, a miracle maker, and a great one. Like O.J. Simpson, Thurman Thomas came to the Buffalo Bills with a vast array of talents and quickly emerged as one of the dominant offensive performers of his era. And what has become habit, Thurman Thomas is annually among league leaders in a multitude of offensive categories. He is a dangerous runner as well as an explosive receiver who has twice surpassed 2,000 total yards in a single season. The, to, in my mind, the single most important quality of uh, a great running back, and that is balance. He can be hit, and you don't topple him, you move him to the side. He can, because of his great balance, he has the ability to cut. He has great discretion when to turn it on, when to go outside, when to cut it back, when to lunge forward. Beyond that, and this was quite a bonus for us, he's a magnificent receiver as a running back. We didn't know he was that good a receiver coming out of college. He rarely, uh, rarely caught a ball. And when called upon the block, he does, he does the dirty work too. Bills are showing pass blocking at the moment. And they're going to throw again. Another blitz. And here's a throw downfield. Reed's got it. 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown. I'm not just a runner that everybody thinks that I am. Uh, you know, you, you have a lot of running backs who can just run the football, and that's just about all they can do. Uh, I like to expand my game, and expanding my game is blocking when I have to pick up blitz and also pass receiving. Not the little five-yard passes, the ten-yard passes, but also the passes downfield, 25 and 30 yards. In Buffalo, Thurman Thomas is the X factor, the clutch player the Bills look to when their push-button offense gets bogged down. Indeed, in a 1989 playoff in Cleveland, Thomas tied an all-time postseason record with 13 receptions. In the 1990 playoffs, he gained over 100 yards rushing in victories over the Dolphins and Raiders before his spectacular effort against the New York Giants that rates among the greatest in Super Bowl history. With Buffalo's passing game neutralized, Thomas single-handedly took on the Giants. Thomas gained 190 total yards in an heroic performance that would have earned him the Super Bowl MVP award had Scott Norwood's kick not sailed wide of the mark.
The disappointing setback did not deter Thomas from picking up in 1991, where he left off in 1990. On opening day, Thomas set a furious pace that even his teammates could not keep up with. In a rare double, he gained over 100 yards running and receiving in what was the league's best individual effort of that season. Since that opening day, Thomas has not let up. Consequently, neither have the Bills. As he shatters record after record, it's not premature to compare Thomas to some of the game's all-time greats. Consider that in his first four years, he has rushed for nearly 2,000 more yards than O.J. Simpson did in similar time. And by leading the league in all-purpose yards three times in a row, he accomplished a feat not seen since Gail Sayers did it in the 1960s. In the end, Thomas's place in NFL history is still to be determined, but make no mistake about his current role. He is one of the NFL's finest overall players, something that did not take Don Shula very long to surmise when asked that very question. There's one that jumps out at me without any uh, uh, prolonged thought, and that's Thurman Thomas. This is a, a player that can do it all. Simpson's departure, the fortunes of the Bills declined, but their ability to entertain remained undiminished. And that was due to a wily Cajun named Joe Ferguson, a quarterback who still holds numerous Buffalo passing records. With Joe Ferguson teaming up with talented receivers like Bob Chandler and Frank Lewis, the Bills' wide open offense of the late 1970s was a prelude to Jim Kelly, Andre Reed, and the no-huddle attack that revolutionized football in the 1990s. Joe Ferguson was drafted by the Bills in 1973 and immediately matured when he was quickly installed as a starter. For the next 10 years, Ferguson was the field leader of an exciting offense that kept the Bills competitive in an era when their overall on-field performance was inconsistent. The Louisiana-bred Ferguson was a gutsy, hard-nosed player, a throwback to a time when quarterbacks succeeded by improvisation and imagination. One 
of Joe Ferguson's finest seasons coincided with the Bills' return to winning football in 1980. To the line of this team is playing inspired football. The stands are going crazy. Ferguson rolling out, looking, throws toward the end zone. It is back to the Ferguson engineered a number of stunning victories, including a last-second nail-biter against the Jets. Waiting, dropping back in the pocket, looking to throw. He throws toward the end zone, and it is caught for a touchdown! Unbelievable! In the season's final week, Ferguson and the Bills triumphed over the 49ers to clinch Buffalo's first division title in nearly 15 years. It took the Bills eight years to regain the top spot in the AFC East. When they did, head coach Marv Levy was very reluctant to let it go. Guys, there's no place else you'd rather be than right here, right now. When it's too tough for them, it's too tough. Hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry. You better hurry. In the no huddle offense, Kelly to throw again. <laughs> Hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry it up! Hurry, you better hurry. Marv Levy's no huddle attack became known as the offense of the 90s. And it sped Buffalo on a course that made them that decade's most dominant and explosive AFC team. The men who made it go were Jim Kelly, the popular and perennial Pro Bowl quarterback and game breakers James Lofton and number 83 Andre Reed. Kelly looking, he throws and he drills it in there to Reed at the 40. Reed at the 35, at the 30, down the sideline to the 20, damn five, touchdown! Andre Reed, the small college superstar from tiny Kutztown State, has emerged as the most prolific receiver in Buffalo Bills history. He's the all-time leader in catches, yardage, and touchdowns, and has earned a team record six consecutive Pro Bowl appearances. For Andre Reed, Jim Kelly, and company, one of the brightest of many shining moments came in the 1990 AFC Championship. Orchard Park, New York, and the road to the Super Bowl goes through Rich Stadium. It is the Bills and the Raiders looking to trade the cold and the snow of western New York for a trip to the balmy breezes of Florida and the Super Bowl in Tampa. Rolls to the right, still on his feet, now throws, it's good to Lawson, he runs it for the score! display of power. The Bills recorded their most points in a playoff game and their largest margin of victory by crushing the Los Angeles Raiders 51 to 3.
No mention of the Buffalo Bills in their greatest moments can be complete without focusing on some of the wildest, most frenetic, fantastic finishes in pro football history. The top-rated defense in the NFL has got to dig in now or the season could be lost. The Bills need to hold them to win their first division title since 66. Two seconds to play. There's the long throw toward the end zone, and it is deflected, incomplete, and the game is over, and the Bills have won the division championship. What a dramatic finish in the fog and the rain of San Francisco. There's life, there's hope. No timeouts left. In the shotgun. Throwing long down the middle for Roland Hooks. He's got it. What a reception. Down to the 35-yard line. And here they come. They have the three wideouts to the right. 12 seconds left. Dropping back. In the pocket. Looking. There's the Hail Mary. Headed for the end zone. And it is caught for a touchdown. Caught for a touchdown. I don't believe it. Inside the three, and here comes Kelly. What a finish. Kelly waiting. Last play of the game. Back to throw, and he's going to run, and he dies for the touchdown. He dove for the touchdown. Jim Kelly is being mobbed. The game is over. The Bills have won it in one of the most dramatic finishes in Buffalo Bills football history. Jim Kelly ran for the touchdown, and the Bills to a man are swarming and mobbing him at the goal line. What an unbelievable finish. The Bills have won it on the final play of the game. Never seen anything like that, man. Never. Never seen anything like that. Absolutely. I've never seen a finish like that. Might just put it up here. They're, they're going to be teeing off on Kinnebrew for sure. Here's Kelly to throw. Looking. And he's got a man there. And it is complete to read at the 20. A flag on the play. To the 10. To the 5. He's in for the touchdown. Let's see what the flag is all about. Let's see who and what it's all about. Andre Reed has the ball. The flag is on the field. And we'll wait for the announcement here. They're waving it off. And no, it's going to stand. It's a touchdown for the the Buffalo Bills' most fantastic finish of all earned them a chapter all to themselves in the NFL record book. It all began on a cold day in January 1993, when the Bills' hopes for a third straight trip to the Super Bowl appeared to be shot down by Warren Moon and the Houston Oilers. The Oilers took a 28-3 halftime lead. What slim possibility Buffalo had of a comeback was shattered in the early minutes of the third quarter. No team had ever come back from a 32-point deficit. Few NFL teams make any kind of comeback with their starting quarterback sidelined. But few teams have ever had as much character as the 1992 Buffalo Bills. Running left, trying to get to the corner flag, and he is in for the touchdown. The comeback began slowly, patiently, with little hope of succeeding. But backup quarterback and hero extraordinaire, Frank Reich, kept plugging away. in the third. Here is Reich. Looking to throw. Rolls out. Throws. Down there is uh, Reed at the five. In for the touchdown. Andre Reed has scored. And now the Bills are back in this game. As this game swung. Oh, ho, ho. Like a tidal wave here at Ridge Stadium. you got to believe if you're a Bills fan. But we're 21 left. You can overcome, baby. You can overcome this. 
407 to play in the third quarter. The clock running. Here's Moon to throw. Looking around. Throws. And it's deflected and intercepted by Henry Jones at the 40. At the 30. The 25. And down he goes to the 23 yard line. was the greatest comeback in NFL history. It was a staggering, towering achievement. The greatest moment among many in the glorious 35-year history of the Buffalo Bills.